Wisconsin in January 1893. My own dear boy, your sonnet is quite lovely, and it is a marvel those red rose leaf lips of yours should be no less for music of song than for madness of kisses. From the moment we met, he made much of me in every way. He was continually asking me to dine or to lunch with him. He flattered me, gave me presents, and made much of me every day. I turned to Sean and said, did I say anything in the heat of the argument that would offend Oscar or Douglas? Nothing, not a word. You have nothing to reproach yourself with. I stormed out of the restaurant because I was afraid I would not be able to convince you and Mr. Shaw and that you would argue wild out of the state of mind I'd gotten him into. You reptile! I was suddenly struck with a similar expression in temper between Lord Alfred Douglas and his unhappy father. I couldn't get out of my head that little face blanched with rage, the wild, hating eyes. The shrill voice, too, was Queensberry's. You are no son of mine, and I never thought you were! Against this, Lord Queensberry protested. And now I ask you, gentlemen, for that protest, are you going to send Lord Queensberry to jail? Now comes the most painful part of the trial. I will introduce you to a series of young men who will testify under oath that Oscar Wilde solicited them to join him in acts of severe indecency. And you attempted to receive money from the gent. Oh, I asked him for some money. At the police station, he refused to prosecute. Yes. So you were liberated. Yes. Uh, I just asked you these very questions under oath, and you said that you had not been taken into custody, nor been to... I'm a waiter at a private hotel at 10 St. James Place. A number of young men of quite inferior station called there to see you while... How weary I am of the whole thing, of the, the, the pain and the suffering and the, the shame. To see those people coming into the box one after the other to witness against me makes me sick. I'm a silver smith. I supplied Mr. Wilde with silver cigarette cases. Person does not help me. It tells me that the law under which I'm being judged is a wrong and unfair law, and the system under which I'm suffering is a wrong and unjust system. I am the housekeeper. After Mr. Wilde's visit, the sheets were stained in a peculiar way. The world is growing more tolerant. One day you will be ashamed of your treatment of me. When asked to sign the bill, Queen Victoria was warned by one of her advisors that, Mom, <laughs> the bill does not include similar behavior between women. To which the Queen responded... <laughs> <laughs> Women! <laughs> do not do such things! <laughs> My guts, 
my breath, whatever I've got left. I'm going as a person, not a patient. I'm going out wanting to live, not wishing I were dead. You are so stubborn and so mule-headed, you will never let anybody help you. Get out of here, Ava. Get out of my life. That's always worked for you, hasn't it? What if to vibrato and you're off the hook? Huh? You have to catch the biggest fish. Win every card game, seduce all the women. As long as you're winning, Lil, everything's fine. But as soon as things get chunky, just jump out the motel window. We love each other, Lil. That's a commitment. That's a commitment. <laughs> Uh, will you do something about this brat before I drown her? Please. You know, I don't have to take that from you. I don't have to stand here and be insulted by a bunch of dykes. Oh. 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 And what are you, sweetheart? Chopped liver? I am bisexual. Oh. 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 I could be if I wanted to. Oh. When we took that cruise to St. John's last summer, I could have had every man on shipboard, couldn't I, Sue? Yeah. Well, to tell you the truth, dear, I thought you did. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I didn't. You know, next summer, this thing would make build a big fire pit down here. We have a summer project. <laughs> yeah. Next summer, <laughs> my summer project is going to be just to fly in the sun with my female. Yeah. And I don't know how much time I'll be able to spend next summer. If I open up my office, I'll have weekday hours, so. I could go hate and you go on tired all the time. Well, I wouldn't miss a summer in Bluefish Cove for anything. <laughs> Love your work, Miss Noyce. Huh. Well, thanks. I'm sure I'll love yours. Don't get him started. <laughs> that scene with the frogs? Oh, those goddamn frogs. That's all anybody talks about. Bring me a vodka stinger. I'll tell you all about the frogs. Right away, sweetheart. He was cute. Too familiar. He didn't have a clue who I was. Who are you? <laughs> fucking Channel 5, that fucking faggot dyke, hermaphrodite, transsexual, <laughs> or whatever the hell they call that for a critic. I told a room full of people to shut up, to hear someone say, Virginia Noise stinks. Oh, I'm sure Channel 5 didn't say Virginia Noise stinks. Maybe something like it, but not those exact words. <laughs> <laughs> Is there, is there a bathroom in here? Uh, over there, Mr. Drew. Are, are you all right? Of course I'm not all right. In, in here, you say? Yeah, yeah. I mean, no. Is that who I think it is? Just, just let him sniff you, Mr. Drew. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Who is that? Torch! No! Torch! No! <laughs> I suppose that's your dog. Murderer! Murderer! I didn't shoot him. Hey, easy, Julia, easy. He's perfectly all right. He better be. Let me see him. Torch, darling, torch. Darling, that's the last of the hound of the Baskervilles. Is that thing real? Oh, no, it's loaded with blanks. Uh, I had to start carrying it after my review of Julie Andrews. <sighs> Me in it. <laughs> it's all my fault. 
If I wanted to fail so badly, but I brought you on your play down instead. <laughs> it's my fault. I wrote it. Torture! <laughs> It's time to try defying gravity. I think I'll try defying gravity. You can't pull me down. Right at the Ethel Barrymore Theater, Peter Austin makes his eagerly awaited Broadway debut. Would that he hadn't. I think it's going to be mixed. <laughs> This is the kind of play that gives playwriting a bad name uh, and deals the theater, already an endangered species, a near fatal death blow. I don't think he liked it. <laughs> I feel good. Really, really good. Thank you, New York Post. I finally got what I wanted. <laughs> I hate it. Now, who does he think he is anyway? My father? A good boy, bad boy. Go play some rugby with your mates in a play with your bleeding puppets. <gasps> but I love me puppets, Daddy. <laughs> and it's my baby, my David, and he says, Mom, I have something to tell you. <laughs> and I'm giddy, I'm flying. I say, what could it be? <laughs> you're gay, you're transsexual, you're a pregnant lesbian, Nigerian flight attendant, <laughs> the woman they could never fire. <laughs> and he says, first off, I'm gay, and I say, Yawn! Next. <laughs> I am so deeply homosexual that with just a glance, I can actually turn someone gay. <laughs> okay, well, that was too easy. <laughs> Sometimes for a lark, I like to stroll through the maternity ward and upset new parents. <laughs> I am Mr. Charles, and I currently reside here in Palm Beach in semi-retirement in exile. You see, I was asked to leave New York. There was a vote. I saw on television that quilt. All spread out in Washington, right on the ground in, in, in front of the Capitol. Over 72,000 squares. It's like a cemetery created by the Ladies' Home Journal. <laughs> and, 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 and so I gathered up all those fancy braids and trims that, that Hank had sent me, and I went over to Newberry's. And I bought a rectangle of hot pink felt, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I wrote his name and embroidered script, and, uh, and I stitched on one of his old report cards and his mittens, and and one of his old t-shirts that says, no one knows I'm gay, only I changed it to say, no one knows I'm from Decatur. <laughs> <laughs> and in the bottom corner, I attached one of the labels I always use that says, especially handmade, just for you, by Barbara Ellen Diggs. Oh, it's gotten... You know how you've been saying that nobody wants to be gay anymore? At, at least not your kind of gay? They don't. Not anymore. Not at Century 21. I saw these guys. They were trying on, like, tank tops and cashmere and cologne. It was like all the nice, normal gay guys and even some of the straight dudes, they sneaked down there to get a fix. You could hear them in the dressing room. It's like they couldn't control themselves. Did they take Nelly breaks? It's like if Patti Lapone was a store. Oh my god. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So, you know how when they're really in trouble, some people ask, what would Jesus do? Uh-huh. 
Well, I asked myself, what would Mr. Charles do? Oh, my. You did? <laughs> so I moved to New York, and it was all so new and, and scary, and I don't have a lot of money, so I'm really living in New Jersey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Have married two girls, but Billy has married a boy. The girls he has tried on every side, but none he could get to agree. All is in vain, he went home again, and since that, he's married Maddie. This nearly 200 year old poem referencing gay marriage was written by, if you need a hint, peek at your programs, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. Did Lincoln? Like and arguably our nation's greatest president, have a homosexual relationship with a man that history records as his best friend. That's what we're here to explore. And from this perspective, we will carefully examine the facts. We will freely admit when gaps in the facts require us to look to context for our best guess or guesses. And when we're done, your job is to form your own opinion as to whether or not there is an initial under the LGBTQIA plus umbrella <laughs> that covers our nation's beloved 16th president. And our hope is that you'll leave here armed with facts that you can present at dinner conversations to impress, intimidate, <laughs> and or bore your friends. I think I might have a plan by which you will be able to attain your end without incurring any debt. I have a very large room and a very large bed in it, which you are perfectly welcome to share with me if you choose. Where is your room? Upstairs. I pointed to the stairs leading from the store to my room. Without saying another word, he grabbed his saddlebags and went on up. I put my things on the floor and came right back down. His face was beaming. Well, speed, I moved. And that's exactly how it happened. I didn't spend some large sum of money on the bed. It was a normal double. Could you both be in it without touching? If you worked at it, you could put a slight space between you. But that would be a full-time job. Like you said, those rope bottoms probably up in the middle. Plus, I'm tall, 6'4". I always have to do some curling in bed, so I take up more than my fair share. I didn't mind. We made it work. <laughs> One bed, two men. Four years? Put a couple more points in the gay column. We didn't question them sharing a bed at this time. Lincoln was sleeping with Speed while you two were hooking up. We never hooked up. But, yes. While I was there, Speed met Fanny Henning. Uh, oh, that's who Fanny is? <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did here, having an ebony queen play the pro-slavery guy's fiance. Happy? I'm not mad. <laughs> I had fair skin and dark eyes. I was pretty. I told you she was a good actress. <laughs> oh, Joshua was a handsome man. His lanky friend was a different story, but I liked him. It wasn't hard to tell that Joshua and Lincoln were close. In my days on earth, I lost three sons and a husband. Yet the press was loath to say a kind word about me. And now, the one thing that history allows me, being the wife of one of the greatest men this country has ever known, is eroding away from me too. Think of that I didn't know about Joshua's speed. I'm not a stupid woman. He wasn't the only one. There was also Captain David Derrickson. No, I, I was going to. I'm sure you were. 